Amen. Thank you, Jay. If you have a Bible, you can open it to Galatians chapter 6. Thank you, Dan, for a rich time in observing the Lord's Supper. It's getting a little chilly out there. In light of those oil prices, we have a goal of keeping our heat off for a certain amount of time. I won't tell you how long, just in case I want to flex a little bit with the weather. <laughs> Galatians chapter 6, and really we just are going to look briefly this morning at the last two verses and then do kind of a flyover uh, and review of the book. Let me pray as we look into God's Word together. Father in heaven, thank you so much for every soul that has come here this morning. And Lord, when we open your Word, it is an occasion for you to speak to us personally by your Holy Spirit and by your written word. And Lord, these are the primary means for us to grow spiritually and also for us to know you more personally and intimately. Lord, I pray that you would lead us and draw us into your word this morning, that you would speak to us as a church, that you would unify us as a body, that we would uh, end this time in this book of Galatians, remembering what's here and why it's important, how it applies to us as a church, and how we should be uh, the pillar and support of your truth, and the center of that truth is the gospel of grace. Lord, help us to be uh, clear on the gospel of grace, not just in our doctrine, but also in our practice and how we think about our own salvation, how we relate to other people. Lord, thank you for the cross this morning. We thank you for all that it accomplished for us, and we pray that uh, you would continue to work in our lives and mold us into the image of your Son. Lord, I pray for your help this morning as we close out this book. In Jesus' name, amen. It's often essential and healthy to revisit the fundamentals of a subject in order to advance in it well. I'll say it again. It's often essential and healthy to revisit the fundamentals of a subject in order to advance in it well. This is the way it is with many sports, drills that are meant to practice the fundamentals, are often carried through in a player's entire career as they advance. For baseball players, there are times when they're in a hitting slump and they have to go back to the very basics of their stance and, and the entire swing in order to get out of their slump. They go back to the fundamentals. Or if we think of a building analogy, any kind of building design must first begin with a solid and sure foundation. Regardless of what is built on top, it may be unique and beautiful and ornate and what most people think of when they think of the building. But if the foundation is off, uh, it is liable, liable to collapse into disrepair. And there are times in a building's life when the foundation must be readdressed, reinforced, even rebuilt, lest the whole thing collapse. And so it is with the life and health of a church. Paul had laid the foundation of the gospel when he proclaimed it at first to these Galatian churches. They were predominantly Gentiles with a background in idolatrous worship and also in immorality and all that goes with that. And yet they heard the gospel of grace and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and they turned to him in repentant faith, and they were saved. And as you know, this corrupting influence of legalism had crept in. And so this epistle is written to reinforce the foundation and fundamentals of their faith. What had been weakened in their faith, with this letter, Paul now aims to strengthen with foundational truth. And God is going to use him again in the same way to strengthen the church in Rome. He's going to go back to the foundation and fundamentals of the gospel. Many of the passages that we looked at here in Galatians are going to be amplified in the book of Romans, which is written later. And so time and again, God uses Paul, and, and throughout the centuries, he's used these two letters to bring the church back to its foundation and fundamental truth. Why was that necessary? Well, we have a tendency to drift. We have a tendency to obscure or forget 
or dull the grace that is brought to us in the gospel of Christ. And two years ago, and this is a little bit being transparent, two years ago, or for the last two years, COVID, <clears throat> COVID-19 was chaos for the evangelical church, in my opinion. We should not define ourselves by or unify ourselves around how we sift through views on a virus as a church of Christ or on political parties, or on public health policy, ever. It doesn't matter what country we're in, what era we're in, what language we speak, how sophisticated our society we live in, the true church of Christ never will be defined and unified by any of those things. We cannot unify around socio-political movements and fads. We cannot divide and split and condemn those uh, that disagree with us based on those issues. Christ died for them if they're a believer. We're unified by one thing, and that is our identity in Christ based on the gospel. That is the church's one foundation, and it is important that as a local body, we are strong and clear on the gospel. And Galatians is strong and clear on the gospel. Now, these are the final two verses in Paul's letter, verses 17 and 18. He has poured out his heart in a strong word of rebuke to these believers. It's a rebuke made in love to them. And he seals it all with his final word, verse 17. He says, from now on, which means, or for the rest of the matters, from now on, let no one cause me trouble. We can imagine the trouble that this whole occasion had caused for this apostle. He had been persecuted and beaten, which we'll see in a minute during his time of ministry in uh, the churches at Galatia or when, when they were first formed, he had poured out his life in, in time and travel, uh, going out on a limb in the first proclamation of this gospel in those cities. He knew these people personally. They knew him personally. They had a, a, a close connection. They had sacrificed for him to be there, and he as well. And now they're drifting off in this false teaching. No doubt along with that came uh, some uh, kind of uh, slander against Paul and his teaching. It caused him trouble. He says, from now on, let no one cause me trouble. I've said enough about the issue. Let no one cause me trouble for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. What is Paul referring to? The term for marks here is the word stigmata, which if you're from my generation brings up uh, pictures of a really bad movie. And it's hardly worth mentioning, but the mystical and downright creepy understanding of this by many Catholics is that this refers to some kind of mystical appearance in people's body of the marks of crucifixion and even sometimes active bleeding. The most famous Example of this in history is known from Francis of Assisi. Others believe that Paul is referring to an actual tattoo or physical brand mark that he had received with the name of Jesus on his body. Many pagan religions at the time, idolatrous religions at the time, this was part of their practice. They would be branded or they would be tattooed with the name of the God that they worshipped, which is why the law of God forbade that amongst the Jews. No tattoos, no marks on their bodies. Paul's not talking about either one of those things. In the context of his life, in the context of where he teaches elsewhere on this type of thing, it is clear that Paul is referring to the physical scars that had been left on his body as a result of being persecuted for preaching the gospel. That's what he's referring to. And these believers knew what he was talking about because it had happened in one of their cities, maybe several Galatian cities, but for sure at least one of them, and it was Lystra. You can turn back there if you'd like, or it's on the screen, Acts 14, 19. This is during his first missionary journey, which according to how we're understanding uh, this book of Galatians, it happened, uh, uh, these churches were part of that first missionary journey. And in the city of Lystra, it says there, in Acts 14, 19, but Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul 
and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. All right? And Jesus had told him that this would be an essential part of his ministry. In Acts 9, when Paul is first called, as Jesus is, is, is getting ready to call him to ministry, it says there in Acts 9, 16, For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And it's very literal in the Greek. He must suffer these things. Or it is necessary for him to suffer so much things for the sake of my name. It was part of what Christ had ordained for Paul in ministry. He describes this in 1 Corinthians 4 verse, verses 9 through 11. In, in present tense time as Paul is going about his apostolic ministry. He says, for I think God has exhibited us apostles last of all. At the top in the church, right? But exhibited as last of all as men condemned to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. Verse 11, to this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty, are poorly clothed, are roughly treated, and are homeless. And that is just so different compared to the lives of so many pastors in evangelical America today. Just such a different description. If someone came into our church and looked that way, we might be very reluctant to allow them in the pulpit. And it would be even more prominent in some of the mega churches we have in our land today. But this was God's will and Christ's will for the great Apostle Paul that his life would look this way. Colossians 1.24, Paul says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, speaking to the church, and in my flesh, he says, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. Which is a strange verse. What does Paul mean there? Well, the th I think the key to understanding it is that when he says what is lacking in Christ's afflictions, he's not talking about the afflictions that Christ himself suffered on the cross. Obviously, as if Paul could add something to the suffering of Christ. He's not talking about that. He's talking about filling up what is lacking or what remains in the afflictions that he's receiving from Jesus Christ sovereignly over his ministry. He knows that in his ministry that there is a race that he must run and finish, right? We hear that in Paul's writings. And along with that comes a certain degree and amount of sufferings. He says, I am filling up what is lacking or what remains in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body. What is that? He says, the church. Paul knew that his life and presentation of the gospel message also included him living a cruciform kind of life where he would exemplify the love of Christ in suffering for people by his own life of suffering to get them the gospel. And that's how God used him in city after city after city. He must suffer for the sake of my name. It was part of Christ's plan for his ministry. And here in this verse, Paul says to these Galatians, here are the marks of Jesus, brand marks of Jesus. That word stigmata was used often in context to convey a branding mark on a slave by which he was identified with his owner. And that's what Paul is saying here to these churches. These scars from real persecution that I've experienced by proclaiming the gospel, this marks me as owned by Christ. These mark me as the true slave of Christ. And his point is, look at these marks, Galatians. Consider the welt that you saw on my head. Consider the fracture on my brow. Consider the scar tissue on my lower ribs from having been stoned. Will these convince you of my message? Will these convince you of my motives? Will these convince you of my genuine love for you and the sincerity of my message? This is his final word at the end of this letter. Don't trouble me anymore. Verse 11 here, I've written with large letters, right? This last section, I will boast only in the cross 
and refuse to evade persecution like these false teachers? And let no one trouble me anymore, for I have the marks. I have the marks to prove the authenticity of my apostolic ministry. And then at the end, he closes with a word of grace. He's rebuked them and says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Lowercase s. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Right? Not just in, in your head and in your theology, but the grace of Christ. And he's talked about that in the whole book. Let it distill into your spirit so that you're just released from this legalism. He calls them brothers, a familiar term, and he says, amen. Now, all this at the end here, both verse 11, the large letters, and this closing word about his marks, I think is Paul's final seal on what he said in the letter. It's his final mark of authentication. It's his final appeal to the church. And after this, he lets go. I think for this morning, as we close, it would be important for us as a church to go back and just consider what are the main themes and emphases in this letter. I want us to remember our time in the book of Galatians. First book that I preached on while I was here. Second series, but first book. I want us to remember the occasion that it came and what was important about revisiting this foundation and fundamental of our faith. There are four exhortations for this morning. As I think through the book as a whole, four exhortations for us to remember this morning. First, that we are to guard the gospel of grace. We are to guard the gospel of grace. This is the predominant atmosphere of the letter. Our first message in this book was titled, Guarding the Gospel of Grace. All the truths of Galatians are couched in a very polemical flavor. Paul is fighting here. And he's battling for the truth of the gospel. He does the same in Romans, but the edge is blunted a little bit. And there, there's more of an explanation and theological development there. Here it is pointed and urgent and against this threat of uh, legalism that will derail these new believers. And Paul crystallizes this gospel of grace in a very legal and forensic way. The emphasis is on justification by faith. There are two books in the New Testament where justification by faith is amplified and made clear, Galatians and Romans, right? This is where we go for clarity on that central doctrine. Justification means that a sinful person, which we all are, though he or she may be truly guilty and really condemned in the, in the sight of God, may nevertheless be truly pardoned and fully forgiven and reconciled to God permanently on the basis of faith alone in Christ alone. And it's because of his work on the cross. Paul states this clearly in chapter 2, verse 15. He says, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we, he's talking about himself and Peter and other Jews, even we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Paul says the same thing three times in a row so that we can hear just how clear he's being about this truth. And it comes antithetical to works of the law, right? We are justified by faith and not works of the law, which is so important for this context, right? The Judaizers were saying, oh yeah, faith in Jesus plus works of the law. Paul says very clearly, no, no, you don't add anything to faith in Christ. It is essential for genuine belief and conversion being justified by faith. And he talks about other aspects of salvation as well. We are adopted as sons having been justified by faith. We receive the Spirit having been justified by faith. We are in union with Christ having been justified by faith. All parts of uh, this, this letter and this main section. And it is the realization of God's future covenant promises which are now realized for the believer. Paul also emphasizes it in that 
wonderful verse, chapter 2, verse 20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me and the life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And we could hear Paul just cherishing this truth of justification by faith. And this leaves us, for us as a church, to have the same priority and the same value system when it comes to the truth of the gospel. It should be on your lips in different contexts of con and conversations that you have that you can't mess with the gospel, right? Say it with me. You can't mess with the gospel. You can't mess with the gospel. According to Galatians, Paul makes it very clear. And we shouldn't be or feel that we have to be sympathetic towards those who do mess with the gospel. We shouldn't be mean to them or sinful to them. But we shouldn't feel the need to link arms with them or embrace them or endorse them, even if they're other churches. And that's popular today to do so. It's okay to say so when a denomination or church or cult distort the gospel. It's okay to point out their error or to warn them of their status before God in doing so. To warn them that they are uh, deceiving others and to warn those in the churches that they are being deceived by a teaching that's not from God. If we fail to do that, it's not okay. Or if we shrink back from doing that out of fear of man, it's not okay. That's the, the, the example Paul gives in this letter. There are certain churches that I, I can endorse. There are certain churches that I should actually point out from the pulpit that they are in error when it comes to the gospel. Certain distinctives about the timing of the rapture, oh, that's okay. You can give some grace there. You have good reasons there. Different beliefs about maybe church polity or things like that. Yeah, we can agree to disagree, but not so the gospel, not the way Paul talks about it here in this letter. We have got to guard the gospel of grace and, and not just to point out error, but to guard the gospel of grace for, for people to come to a saving knowledge of Christ. This, this gospel of grace is, is the only door through which people can come and be saved. The only door. And for centuries and centuries, it was distorted and it was veiled so that people could not come to a saving faith in Christ. As a church, we have to guard that door and make sure it stays open through adhering to this letter. If we remember from Galatians chapter 1, Paul had said, if anyone should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed, in verse 8. And he says it twice there. That, that means that this person will go to hell and be damned. Just severe language that Paul uses. It's okay for us to feel that way, to think of it the same way, to value and guard the gospel the same way that Paul is here in this letter. This book ends the letter. He says it there at the beginning about just how important the gospel is to guard. I think he says it and touches on it at the end in verse 14. But may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. He says elsewhere in 1 Corinthians 9, Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. This was the center of his life and ministry. So it is for our church that we make as first priority to guard the truth of the gospel of grace, not just its content, but also its incarnation in our lives, in our love to others with the gospel of grace, and for that to, to fill our hearts and our character. Number two, the second exhortation from this letter is to live to please God and not man. To live to please God and not man. This Second exhortation and theme, as I see, is more of a harmony in the letter than the melody. The melody is justification by faith, but in the backdrop is this theme of living to please God and not man. It is an undercurrent, a sub-theme, but it's surprising to me how prominent a role it plays in Paul's thoughts. We find also that this book ends the letter and also shows up in the middle. 
If you remember from chapter 1 again, verse 10, after saying that those who distort the gospel are accursed, Paul jumps in with a surprising thought in verse 10, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. And there he says that these two primary motivations cannot coexist in gospel ministry. And we find out throughout the letter why this is so important to him. We talked about it last week as Paul highlights the ulterior motives of these false teachers. If you see the other bookend in the letter back in chapter 6, verse 12, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. But they desire, end of verse 13, to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. And that's just three ways of saying that they're persuading you to do this for the sake of other people. They want to make a good showing of their own ministry, right? They want to avoid the persecution that comes from other people. And they want to be able to boast in front of those other people about your flesh. And we, we see why in the very beginning Paul says, look, if, if I am a servant of Christ, I can't be motivated by that. And we find it in the middle as well where Peter, when Paul recalls his time at Antioch when this, this teaching came there to that early church, verse 12, Galatians 2 he says, for before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. Peter was, should have been very clear on the full fellowship of Gentiles in the church. If you read in the book of Acts, Peter was the first to, to convey the gospel to Cornelius' household and, and observe the Holy Spirit fall upon that family just as he had fallen upon the Jews at Pentecost. Peter had eaten with them in the past as full-fledged believers. Prior, he was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself. And then it says, fearing the party of the circumcision, fearing the circumcision party. So this shows up as a dominant theme or sub-theme in the letter. What does this mean for us? It means that with our faith in Christ must come a courage for us to, uh, uh, a courage to stand for Christ in us. This is a must that we must be willing as believers, every single one of us who makes a profession of faith, there, there goes along with that a necessity for us to have courage to stand for Christ. It's a must. It's a non-negotiable for a follower of Jesus. In other times, in other cultures, this was implicit and understood in the whole transaction. Today in the Muslim world, there are many countries where it is permissible and legal for a father or brother in a family to, to beat or even kill a family member for converting to Christianity out of Islam. It's legal. The government sanctions it. The government will not protect the victim. The government will be okay with that kind of a crime. For them, it's, do you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead? If they see yes, there are huge stakes involved. And this was the same for many in Christ's day, this was the same for many Jews who had believed then. The stakes vary from place to place and time to time. But universally, for every believer, make no mistake about it, we must be ready to take a stand for Christ and not to worry about pleasing people. See? And it's just, it's so easy and it's always there. But in our hearts, there must be this commitment to stand for Christ, to identify publicly as a Christian, to speak up when something is wrong, to refuse to go along with the immorality in a certain social group, not to laugh at the wrong jokes, to testify as to why you don't do those things or don't do other things. And it could come up in subtle ways throughout our lives at school, even at Christian school. It can come up at work come up in family. And there's a temptation all the while to backpedal on issues that are very unpopular to the culture, but very clear in Scripture. Right? We, we feel that all the time in America today. Backpedal on issues that are so clear in God's Word, but will be hard for a postmodern American to hear.
If it's unacceptable in our culture, it doesn't mean it's wrong. <laughs> it just might mean it's very unpopular. You know, the course of popular ideas today runs very swiftly. It doesn't mean that the Word of God is wrong or the ethics are wrong. It just means that it's not palatable today. We have to be ready, like 1 Peter 3.15 says. It says, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. So that's first. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, right? Do it gently and respectfully, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to, to, to shame. But the command there is always be ready to make a defense. And that's for every believer without the fear of man, with a desire to please God, to be ready to stand up for Christ. Do we have that in us to be courageous for Christ in that way? Well, not in my flesh, I don't. My courage must come from the Spirit and from God's presence with me. It starts with a simple heart that says, Lord Jesus, I love you for what you've done on the cross and I want to be courageous for you. I want to stand up for you. I want to be salt and light in the world. Use me for your work in the, in the world. But Lord, give me the grace to stand up for you. Help me to stand up for you in this way. You know, when I was a new believer, my conversion to Christ came about the same time that we got a new youth pastor at our church. He must have been like 23 or something, fresh out of Bible college. I was about 17. Right? In those days, you know, someone 23 looks a lot older, right? And he was married at the times, and he had a couple little kids, so I looked, looked up to him a lot. And he was a great youth pastor to have as sort of my first youth pastor and, and close discipler. And the main thing that I remember about his ministry to me was that message after message after message, this was the theme, taking a stand for Christ. That was, that was it. Bow your heads, close your eyes. If you're ready to take a stand for Christ today, raise your hand. And over and over, this was the message. Now, I'm sure he preached on other things, but that's the main thing that I remember. And it was good because it, it forced me to make my faith public and to take a stand in my decisions as a teenager and what I did. And it set me on a trajectory for life. It's essential for every believer. We, 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 we shouldn't cut... Cut our kids short of that calling, right? We shouldn't set the bar low, just hope the majority will meet it there because that's not the bar that Jesus sets for disciples. It doesn't matter how old you are. If you're a believer in Christ, then it means you're a disciple of Christ. We don't have sort of the B version of the New Testament that we give to teens and say, okay, you know, we, we want you to be a Christian and we want you to be in the church, but it's okay if you don't. He doesn't, he doesn't call us that way. He calls us to full discipleship. And it means if you are a Christian, be a Christian and stand up for Christ. It's important for us to live to please God and not man. Number three, the third theme and emphasis I see in this letter for us to remember and take away is that we're called to live by the Spirit in freedom. We're called to live by the Spirit in freedom. And Paul spends the first major portion in this letter, talking about the authenticity of his message based upon his, his life and ministry, that God had proven Paul over time to be an authentic apostle, even though he wasn't one of the original 12 or 11. He then spends the rest of the, the main section defending his gospel theologically and biblically, chapters 3 and 4. But in chapter 5, he turns the corner to describe life lived by the Spirit. We had several messages surrounding this section. Several people thanked me for those messages, and I appreciate that. But it was really for me as well. I think they found it so helpful because this is where we live the majority of our Christian life, right? We're, we're in the pro If you're in Christ and have believed, then you have embraced the doctrine of justification by faith. And it's a wonderful doctrine to remember and, and, and cling to and celebrate. But we are in the process of being sanctified. 
How that happens is so important for us to engage with in our life. And, and Paul touches on that clearly in chapter 5. It is life lived in the Spirit in freedom. In part, this answers the problem that he's addressing. <clears throat> this doesn't get as much space as earlier sections, but logically, it's a huge part of the letter because the dilemma in the background with these Judaizers is, how will Christians who are free then, out from under the law, tangibly live lawful lives? It's almost as if in their minds there are only two choices, that righteousness is going to have to be by law, or people will live sinfully. Well, Paul in this section says it's neither in the new covenant. With the coming of the Holy Spirit, Christians are set free from the law and are to live a tangibly righteous life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Three key verses here highlight this section. Look at Galatians 5.1. For freedom, he says, Christ has set us free. We emphasize this was part of the purpose of Christ's work on the cross. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So one of the things to remember as a church is that we are to be on guard with the gospel of grace, but also to stand firm in our freedom. We start to hear teaching or come across trends where we're, we're trending into a way that is, it is thinking, well, all believers ought to do this, something not explicit in the Word of God, or, or all, if, you're, if you're a mature believer, then you will do this. It can be all kinds of things creep into churches that way. Instead, we're to stand firm that, no, we are free in Christ. If this is not prohibited in the Word of God or commanded in the Word of God, then we are free to come to our own conviction, and we should have a variety of convictions on different things in a healthy church, respecting one, another, one another's convictions as we formulate them well. That's standing firm in our freedom. Look at verse 13 of chapter 5. We're called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And there Paul is, headed, is anticipating this objection that if they're free, they'll just live in the flesh. Paul says, no, no. Our freedom in Christ is not to live in the flesh, but it's free to love and serve one another. And he goes on to say that this love for one another fulfills the law. And third, verse 16, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And so these concepts of freedom in Christ and love for one another and living by the Spirit all coalesce together. So we think about Galatians as a church and we think about healthy Christian living. These are the three main concepts that should come to our mind. We are free in Christ by the gospel. And we are free to love one another. If we love one another genuinely, as Christ taught us, we will be fulfilling the law. And that comes through the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And it's called the fruit of the Spirit because it innately will grow in the character of someone who has the Spirit of God in their life. If we live by the Spirit, which if we're in Christ, we all are alive by the Holy Spirit. He's come to indwell us as believers. If we live by the Spirit, then let us walk in the Spirit, he says at the end of chapter 5. This is the main section in Galatians. If in a year from now, two years from now, you're struggling in your Christian life, Remember, in Galatians, there is a section there about healthy Christian living. Let me go back there and look. Let me go back there and read. Number four. Fourth theme and exhortation that I see is that we're to treasure our Savior and our salvation. We're to treasure our Savior and our salvation. It's hard to miss this in the middle and bulk of the letter. Paul argues theologically about his gospel from the Old Testament, making it clear that what he is proclaiming is nothing new or novel, but that God uh, 
foreshadowed this gospel in the Old Testament, and the Old Testament anticipated this gospel. But along the way, he wants to convey to these, these new Gentile believers the benefits that they have in Christ. They have been deceived into thinking that there is something better out there spiritually. That if they follow this very Jewish mode of Christianity, embrace the law, embrace the Jewish calendar and the festivals and other aspects of rabbinic practice, that they will be ushered into the, the greater and higher kind of Christian living. You know, that is still out there today. You meet someone who practices those things or who embrace, has embraced those things, maybe in this sort of latter stage of their Christian life, they got tired of sort of the old things. You know, they wear prayer tassels or prayer shawls or observe different festivals. They listen to maybe a very sp specific Jewish teacher or something like that. Just tell them that was the first heresy. Just tell them, yeah, Paul would not agree with you. Just tell them you have everything and more in Christ. Tell them those things foreshadowed Christ and were a picture of what was greater and what was to come. And that's what Paul tries to convince these believers of in these sections. Listen to a couple key verses. Chapter 3, verse 7. He says to them, know then, or be assured, that it, that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. We can imagine the objection, right, circling in their minds. Oh, no, no, you guys actually are not technically sons of Abraham, right? You're not part of the Abrahamic covenant that was made to ethnic Jews or the Mosaic covenant. In order to do so, circumcision, keep the law, then you'll be really in the in crowd. Paul says, no, no, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And that distinguishes these believers from thousands and thousands of Jews at the time. Verse 9 of chapter 3. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Abraham's inheritance and the things promised to him are theirs also by faith. And that we are sons of God as well by faith. Later on in chapter 3, verse 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. It's yours in Christ. The greatest promises ever made are now realized in the new covenant. And you are in Christ and they're yours. And last, Galatians 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. And Paul wants them to know very clearly and to treasure the great Savior they have and the great salvation he's accomplished. We think about many of our lives this morning. We're here. Some of us have grown up in Christians ho Christian homes. Some of us maybe not. I don't think any of us here are ethnically Jewish per se. I know the Frishes have some extra blessing in their family a little bit. But each one of us, Paul calls us in this letter to a full realization that because we have been united to Christ himself, the Messiah, united to Jesus, King of the Jews, King of Kings, he is our Savior, brother, friend, Lord, master, leader, shepherd, and king. We have everything in Christ. For Paul is heart in this letter. The, the, the tone we hear in his voice is that the gospel is all about Jesus. And the church should be all about Jesus as well. Jesus crucified and all sufficient for our salvation. So please... Remember the book of Galatians. Treasure your salvation and our great Savior. Cultivate a life lived by the Spirit and the freedom we have in Christ. 
stand up for Christ and live to please God rather than men and guard the gospel of grace because it is our hope and the hope of the world. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for our time in this great epistle. We thank you for Paul's words here, that they have been inspired by you and preserved by you down through the ages. We thank you that there is such clarity in this epistle on the gospel and our being justified by faith alone. Thank you because of that truth. Each one here this morning who is a believer in Christ stands perfectly righteous before you positionally, that we are clothed in his righteousness by faith as a gift of your grace. Lord, I pray that by the Spirit, we would be transformed into his character and be righteous practically and tangibly in this world so we can be salt and light and faithful ambassadors of this truth. Lord, be with us in the coming weeks as we, we, we launch into a new section of your word. We thank you, Lord, that it is able to build us up in our faith. In Jesus' name, amen.